On Point with Craig's Investment Partners. The information provided here is general in nature. It's not financial advice. It doesn't take into account your financial situation, objectives, goals or risk tolerance. All investments are subject to risks and none are guaranteed. So before you make any investment decisions, we recommend you contact an investment advisor. For more information about our services in that regard, you can go to our website, which is craigsip.com. Welcome to On Point. I'm Mark Lister, Investment Director at Craig's Investment Partners, and I'll be talking about a range of topics, including economics, portfolio strategy, investor education, and anything else that's happening out there in financial markets. Morning, team. That's another week down. Let's look back on how it played out for investors, and then we will turn our focus to what is coming. Last week, the S&P 500 in the US rose another 1.4%, so that's another Another closing high uh, for the the key index in the US that came on the back of some very impressive earnings releases. Uh, the one that stands out is is Meta, very strong result, and the stock was up twenty odd percent on the day. So uh, good earnings releases and some quite positive economic data. We saw the jobs report come in stronger than expected. The ISM index was stronger than expected. Those things came on the back of that strong GDP report from the previous week. So good news all round in the US and the market has started the new year where it left off in 2023, having gained 4% and we're only just a month into 2024, aren't we? Uh, Other markets, Japan rallied 1.7% while the UK, Europe and emerging markets were little changed. We had the Australian ASX 200, another very strong week there. That market was up 1.9%. That actually finished last week at a new record high, surpassed the previous peak from August 2021. And the New Zealand market, the NZX 50, rose about half a percent. Interest rates, not a huge amount of movement on that front. The US 10-year Treasury yield fell slightly, finished the week at 4.0, down from 4.1%. The local five-year swap rate here in New Zealand declined uh, about 11 basis points. It finished at 4.2%. Oil prices were down down about 7%, finished the week at $72 a barrel. That uh, essentially saw oil reverse all of the gains of the previous week, and that came in spite of a decision by OPEC Plus to leave uh, production and output unchanged. Looking through some of the key economic releases, and we'll start locally, the one that I was most interested in was Business Confidence. Uh, This was the January edition of the ANZ Business Outlook Survey, which I find extremely useful for giving us uh, a lead into what is coming. Uh, A lot of the other data you see is backward looking, whether it's GDP, whether it's inflation, whether it's a labour force, but some of these surveys give you a much more up-to-date view about what what businesses are are thinking and feeling. We saw another good rise in sentiment here. The headline confidence index rose further. It's sitting at the highest level since July 2014. The own activity measure, which is the one I pay more attention to because it tends to be a more useful leading indicator, for where economic activity is growing, uh, going, I should say, that dipped slightly. Uh, although when you look at the three month average, that measure is at its highest level since October 2017. So seven odd years ago. So things, things are positive on that business confidence front. Uh, inflation expectations fell in the survey from 4.6 to 4.3. That's good, still too high, but at least they're going in the right direction. However, the proportion of firms that are expecting to raise their prices uh, over the next little while, that remained pretty high. It's pretty much pretty much at 50%. So uh, when you've got half of the companies out there saying, look, we're going to raise our prices over the next few months, that probably isn't what you want to see from an inflationary perspective. The retail sector saw a big jump. Uh, 66% of retail sector firms are expecting to raise their prices over the next few months. And I think that could potentially reflect the recent increase we've seen in freight and shipping charges because of all the disruption you're seeing in in the Red Sea and so forth. So some good and bad there. Uh, The Reserve Bank speech, Paul Conway, look, I won't dwell on that one. It was largely as I expected. He, He went to a lot of effort to point out that while we had seen headline inflation fall, 
uh, domestic inflation, non-tradables inflation was very high. He also talked a little bit about that uh, GDP report that we saw come out late last year and how the when you look under the surface, uh, there was a slightly different story that is being told compared to the headline numbers. So long story short, it was, it was a reminder from Mr Conway that uh, there's no interest rate cuts that are coming super soon. Uh, we will have to wait until later in the year. And uh, that's always been my expectation. You know, I think uh, we will see OCR cuts this year, but some of that talk that you might see them in the first half of the year could be a little premature. I still believe the second half of the year is a more likely time frame, and August is still uh, the time that many of the economists believe would be the most logical time. So uh, largely as expected there from our Reserve Bank. Internationally, there was a lot to follow. Uh, US economic releases were good. Uh, the ISM index, as I mentioned, that's the Institute of Supply Management Index. Uh, you get a manufacturing one, you get a ser uh, services one. Last week it was a manufacturing sector, the services sector, uh, we'll see that um, that report, I think, on Monday, uh, overnight on Monday in the US. But the manufacturing index for January, much better than expected. It rose to 49.1, so it's still below 50, uh, but that was above forecasts, that was above 47.1 in December, and it was actually the highest we'd seen in 15 months, so the highest in more than a year. And when you look at the new orders component, which is a good leading indicator for future activity across the manufacturing sector, that surged to 52.5, which is a big jump from 47 in December. And that's actually the strongest we've seen since May uh, 2022. Uh, so good news there. Less encouragingly, and this is sort of a little bit the same as that ANZ Business Outlook survey, isn't it? You had some good figures pointing to activity but some of those inflation indicators weren't quite as good. And in the ISM survey, the prices paid index jumped to a nine-month high of 52.9. So again, I think that could reflect uh, some of those recent increases in freight and shipping costs. So good and bad there. Also the jobs report, and this was out on Friday night, so we saw it on Friday morning here in New Zealand. Uh, very good news uh, from an economic growth and activity perspective. Uh, the labour market remained very strong in January. Uh, the monthly jobs report uh, easily beating expectations in terms of the headline figures. So the number of new jobs created 353,000, so that's above forecast for 180. That's ahead of an upwardly revised 333,000 in December, and it's the strongest in 12 months. So good news there from a labour market strength perspective. The unemployment rate steady at 37 uh, that compares with forecasts for a small uptick to 3.8. So instead of seeing that uptick, it was flat at 3.7. Wage pressures a little more persistent than hoped. Average hourly earnings running at an annual rate of 4.5%. Uh, that's the highest since February last year. It's a little above forecast for 4.1. It's still not at those levels that we've seen uh, through the cycle uh, wage growth was running much hotter than that, but still a little stronger than expected, as you would probably expect to see uh, if you have got further indicators that the labour market remains very strong. On the central banking front, the Federal Reserve meeting was the highlight. Uh, so we saw this on Thursday morning last week in New Zealand. Uh, the Fed left interest rates unchanged at 5.5. That's the highest since 2001, and no one was expecting them to move at all. So it was all about the commentary and what they were saying about the future. If we recap to last year at the, the final Fed meeting of 2023, they signalled that their tightening cycle was over, and their set of forecasts that they released then implied there would be three quarter of a percent interest rate cuts in 2024. Since then, we've seen some really good progress on the inflation front, and I talked about this uh, in another episode where we talked about the soft landing that might be upon us and what that means for investors. If you missed that one, 
uh, there's some good stuff in there that you do need to hear. So go back and have a look at it. But with further progress having been made on the inflation front, financial markets had moved to price a much more aggressive path of easing than the Fed. So there was a lot of attention on what they thought about that and uh, a lot of attention on when we might see that first interest rate cut because for the Fed the next move is down. We know that it's just a matter of when it comes and the Fed did acknowledge that moderation. We've seen an in inflation pressures but Chair Jerome Powell also said he wanted to see more evidence of a sustained decline in inflation. So at the moment the last six months inflation is pretty much running at the Fed's 2% target. So six months is obviously not enough for the Fed to have confidence that that uh, level of inflation will be sustained. Uh, the next meeting is in March. There'll be two inflation reports, I think, between now and then. So that'll be eight months worth of data. He did say quite explicitly that March is not likely to be the time for that first cut. So I guess that suggests that eight months worth of figures also won't be enough. Uh, and because of that, we did see markets change their view on when you might get that first rate cut. So odds for a cut at the March meeting ended last week at 20%. So they were at 50% a week earlier. And to come down from 50% chance to 20% chance. That's partly on the back of Powell's comments and it probably also is partly on the back of uh, that stronger economic data as well. Looking ahead to the May meeting, which will be the next one, uh, early May, markets still see a good chance of a cut then, 86%, uh, so quite a high chance. And uh, I think for investors, when we're thinking about the rate cut probabilities, whether it's here in New Zealand, whether it's in the US, um, it's, it's unclear when we will see that first cut. But for people that are looking ahead six months, 12 months and beyond, the more important message is that the next move will be down and it will probably come uh, over the next six months or certainly this year. We'll certainly see rate cuts this year. So I wouldn't get too worried or hung up on whether it's, um, whether it's March or May for the US and whether it's May or August here in New Zealand. Looking ahead on a 12-month view, uh, interest rates are coming down and you need to make sure that your portfolio is ready for that. We had the Bank of England as well. This one was really interesting too. This was the first monetary policy decision of the year for the Bank of England. They left interest rates unchanged. They're at five and a quarter. Uh, that's the highest since 2008. But what I found really interesting here is that the Monetary Policy Committee was clearly quite divided about what to do next. So it voted six to three in favour of no change. Although though the three votes that that were dissenting votes that wanted to do something else, uh, that they they reflected a view of going in different direction. So you had two of those members vote in favour of another hike, and you had one of those members vote for a cut. And to find the last time you saw members vote in the same meeting for both moves up and down was way back in 2008. So really interesting. It does tell you that we're very much at a turning point, doesn't it? UK inflation has been a little stronger than expected lately. It's tracking at 4%. Uh, that's, that's what we saw in December. That was a little higher than hoped at that time. Having said that, it's still the second lowest reading since September 2021. So I, I think for the Bank of England, like, like the Reserve Bank here in New Zealand, like the Federal Reserve, like just about every other central bank out there outside of the Bank of Japan, the next move is down and it's just a matter of when. Current pricing uh, sees little chance of any move at the March meeting. Uh, so the Bank of England's next meeting is in March, probably no change there. But then you fast forward to May and markets see about a 40 odd percent chance uh, of a cut. So May is definitely in play. If not May, it'll be the one after that, which I think is, um, I think is the July meeting. Uh, right, looking to the week ahead, let's start with what is happening on the local calendar. It will obviously be a holiday shortened week with uh, Waitangi Day on Tuesday, so uh, those, the, those people that want to get a four day weekend will take Monday off and I would expect it to be quite a quiet week across uh, New Zealand markets. Um, a three day week for many, not myself, but for many it will be. Uh, having said that, we will get a couple of interesting economic releases. We will have another dairy auction 
uh, out on Wednesday morning, early Wednesday morning. And things have been going pretty well for the dairy sector of late. Prices rose another 2.2% at the last auction. So we've seen four consecutive increases now at four auctions since early December. And the headline GDT index, the Global Dairy Trade Index, is up almost 25% since the lows from August last year. So it's at the highest level in nearly 12 months. Uh, in terms of Fonterra's uh, milk price forecast for this season, it's got a midpoint of 750 at the moment. Now that will be lower than the last two years, but those two last two years were very, very strong. And at 750, that's still well above uh, the average of the last of the five years preceding the last two. So it, it's not terrible. Having said that, uh, costs have gone up and if you've got debt, uh, a lot of debt in, in for, on your farm, then you will be feeling the brunt of higher interest rates too. So at 750, a few farmers are still probably uh, close to break even or maybe even not breaking even, uh, depending. Uh, but still, uh, you've got a few economists that are more upbeat than that. I know the ANZ team are forecasting 770 for this season, so they see a little bit of upside uh, from where uh, Fonterra is at today. And for the 2024-2025 season, which is just around the corner, ANZ have a, an 850 forecast. So maybe there is better times ahead for the dairy sector. Also on Wednesday, we will get the New Zealand Labour Force report for the December 2023 quarter. This will be out at 10.45, and I think it will be the economic highlight of the week. If we look back to the previous quarter, the September quarter, we saw further evidence that the labour market was easing and that wage growth was continuing to slow. So that, that was positive from a, an inflation perspective from the Reserve Bank's point of view. Employment actually fell a little bit. Uh, the headline unemployment rate increased a little bit. It's sitting at 3.9. That's still very low by historic standards, uh, but it was the highest in more than two years. And importantly for the Reserve Bank, wage growth continued to moderate as well. So we'll be looking for further progress on that front uh, this week. Markets and economists are looking for solid employment growth, so for more jobs to have been created, but they also expect the unemployment rate to rise to 4.3%, and that would be the highest unemployment rate since March 2021, you know, almost three years ago. What's really important to remember is that the reason uh, you've got unemployment trending higher is that you've got strong migration, which is adding to the supply of labour. So it's not because you're seeing widespread job losses. In fact, you have got the uh, relatively unique situation where there are still more jobs being created, but you've also got the unemployment rate ticking up. And, and that's because the supply of labour is increasing. There's more people coming into the country. And from the perspective of the Reserve Bank, and I, I think for, from a financial markets perspective, that is a good thing because we need to see the labour market ease a little bit so that businesses can find it easier to get workers and so that wage pressures aren't quite as high uh, because that does point to more progress in the future on the inflation front, which should give the Reserve Bank a bit more confidence that it can reduce interest rates at some point. So that, that's what we'll be expecting on Wednesday morning here in New Zealand. Across the Tasman, we've got the Reserve Bank of Australia meeting, and this will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be on holiday, but uh, keep an eye on that if, uh, if you like following central banks. The decision is out at 430 now, the Reserve Bank of Australia is sitting at 4.35%, so a little bit lower than ourselves in terms of their cash rate, but still the highest since 2011. And as is the case with most others, financial markets think that that's peaked and that the next move will be down. So I think we'll probably get confirmation of that uh, this week. There's, there's two clues that suggest this week's meeting from the RBA will be a little more eventful than usual. The first one is that the statement on monetary policy will be released at the same time as the policy announcement, rather than being published three days later. You know, that usually comes out on a Friday. Uh, but the, this time around, the RBA is going to release it on Tuesday afternoon at the same time they make their policy announcement. They also have scheduled a press conference uh, with RBA Governor Michelle Bullock uh, one, hour, one hour 
after the decision, so at 5.30 New Zealand time. So that to me suggests that the RBA has more to say than usual, and if I had to guess, it would be them formally announcing that uh, they're at the top and the next move is down because they've had that sort of bias to more interest rate hikes uh, in the past, and that, that could be something that has changed. Uh, in terms of the timing, uh, again, it's up in the air at the moment. Pricing points to the May meeting as one potential opportunity. Uh, that's priced into the tune of about 40-odd percent. Uh, July, that goes up to about 60%. So, you know, maybe it's May, maybe it's July. We'll just wait and see. Uh, we did see some good inflation data in, the, in Australia last week for the December quarter. And I mean, good in the sense that it was lower than expected. The headline CPI fell to 4.1%. Uh, that's down from 5.4 in the previous quarter. It was below forecast. It was the lowest since late 2021. So uh, we have seen some good news on that front uh, across the Tasman. Uh, a few other things to keep an eye on that I won't really debate um, or, or comment on too deeply. Uh, we will get the results of the Consumer Expectations Survey from the European Central Bank. Uh, in the US, we'll get the Fed's Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, SLUS as they call it, on Monday. There's wage data due in Japan on Tuesday. We've got the latest inflation figures in China on Thursday. Uh, also on Thursday, Janet Yellen, who is the, the US Treasury Secretary, previous Fed Chair, uh, Janet Yellen is testifying to the Senate Banking Committee on Financial Stability. So uh, there's plenty to keep an eye on, not quite as eventful as last week in terms of the, the high profile releases and events, but still plenty to keep an eye on. And it will also be another big week of earnings releases internationally. Uh, I think we have got you know, plenty more uh, S&P 500 companies scheduled to announce results. And while the big tech stocks are behind us, for the most part, there will be companies from a wide range of other sectors. So some of the highlights for me will be Caterpillar, McDonald's, Alibaba, Costco, CVS Health, Disney, PayPal, and Unilever. Looking forward to hearing from all of those. So far, the reporting season has been pretty good. You know, there's obviously been some results that are stronger than others, but at very close to the halfway mark, we have seen 65%, so about two thirds of companies exceed revenue forecasts, and about 72%, so seven out of 10, have beaten earnings estimates. And for the, for the December 2023 quarter on the whole, in aggregate, if you look at the whole market and put it together, uh, the aggregate earnings growth rate is tracking at about 1.6%. That's relative to the, the same quarter a year earlier. So that, that would be the second consecutive quarter of growth. Uh, expectations have been very low for the, the earnings results um, this quarter. Uh, and for the most part, they have come in much stronger than expected. So it's been it's been a very pleasing earnings season so far and plenty to come. Because like I said, we are only halfway there. All right, thank you for listening. We will talk again soon. Enjoy your week all.